Alrighty, let's... All right, let's let's get this thing started here. So, what my presentation is about is uh, it's Cake PHP web application interfaces for humans, and uh, you see, you guys are on the GUI track, and and what this basically is is a lot of times as developers we tend to forget that uh, the people using our software are human. And there's a psychology to interface development, and that's kind of just I'm just going to go into, not the psychological details of it, but just some basics into things as a developer that will help you make more usable interfaces and better interfaces for your clients and the people using your software. Um, because interfaces tend to be sometimes a secondary to the actual function of the application. Um, let's see if this thing's actually going to work right. Okay, so, so why bother even studying this kind of stuff? And uh, the process of this is, is known as humanization, which is, um, we'll define here. And humanization basically it ensures that your software isn't worthless to end the user, um, to the end user. And uh, what I mean by that is like, I love writing software, but I hate using it. Um, to, to like, a perfect example would be a Windows in general. Try to do anything on Windows if you're a Mac user or you know, think computers should make sense, and it, it doesn't work the way it should. Um, anything from like uh, menu buttons and things like that, like it's all, it, you're forced to learn how to use it instead of it being cognitive to you understanding how it should be used. Um, which basically, there's, there's no way to just look at uh, the Microsoft operating system and say, oh, that's how it's to be used, except for the start button. But that doesn't really help either because you get lost there. So, you know, basically what this is going to go over is some of the general principles that you can keep in mind while designing an interface or trying to make choices like whether to choose, you know, a checkbox or a radio button and things like that. And this, this information basically helps you decide when designing an interface or creating an interface, you know, what, how, how you should go about doing it. So what exactly is humanization? Um, the definition technically would be to imbue with humanness or human kindness, which is basically um, if you, you know, the process of humanization is admitting the fact that your end user is a human. Um, so the, the, the purpose of this is uh, I'm sure you've all had software that you have had to use and have hate using it. Um, Examples I know for me personally are, are Dreamweaver at times before they got around. It was you had to use it because it was the only really IDE that was available for web development that had syntax highlighting and stuff, and that was a Windows based thing. But uh, there were a lot of elements in that were uh, a pain in the rear, like when you had to FTP stuff and wait for the progress bar to upload your work. You know, you couldn't do it in the background. And uh, times you get just frustrated with your computer and you know, hope you spill coffee on it. And that's what the lack of humanization in application development creates is basically frustration to the end user and therefore it results um, in that they, they wouldn't want to use your software. So, you know, if you humanize your software, people actually want to use it. Um, so, some simple truths about humanization and what that entails in application development. Um, Modern day development, the humanity of the end user is often neglected. And the, the major disconnect between software and people is software, because it's built on top of logic, is a, a linear process. It has a workflow from one point to the next point to the next point. And that's, I mean, that's basically essentially how a computer works. It's a single command at a time process, one after another. Humans are multidimensional. <laughs> We're taking in sights, sounds, touch, and all at one time. And so we interact with systems using all those uh, senses. And uh, that's, that's where an interface you know, basically comes in, is trying to correlate us, the multidimensional being, into a linear system to basically help facilitate whatever task we're trying to achieve. Um, 
basically that's another simple truth is the end user when they either you know use your software for whatever task it's to fulfill whether it's banking software or a CMS or a blog they expect it to do what they want it to do it, it doesn't really matter what your software does is if it's to create a blog and their understanding of a blog is to only post new elements to the web and everything else is done for you that's basically what they're going to expect because that's what they want it to do. Um, and while I'm going through this presentation, if you guys have any questions or want me to clarify, just you know, throw a hand up and ask. I, I'd be more than willing to clarify anything I say that might not make any sense. Um, and the other thing is people won't use what they don't like. If they don't like your software, they're not going to use it. Like oil and water, kind of like Jiwoo and YAML, as we found out yesterday. He doesn't like it, he's not going to use it. Um, okay, some, some principles. We're all a bunch of users. I want to demonstrate this. Okay, I have these two images here. And they're both in focus to you. Now, I want to do a little experiment. Is try to concentrate on the details of both of these images at the same time. I can see your eyes going back and forth. It's not actually possible. And basically what this is, is a lot of people will say, you know, what's the focus of the attention of the user and stuff, and focus is often misused. You basically are, your important fact of humanization is understanding the difference between a focus and a locus, which keeping things in locus is basically defined by the definition. The focus is the distinction or clarity of an image that we see. So both of these images are clear. You can tell what they are. A locus is being the center of focus of greatest activity or concentration. When you guys try to concentrate on either one, your mind shifted from one image back and forth, trying to concentrate on both, because there only could be one of those elements in the locus of your attention at a given time. And this is important in designing good interfaces, in directing your users and achieving good usability, is to guide your user's locus of attention to where it needs to be to accomplish the task that they're doing without distracting them or moving them off of the task that they're trying to do. Um, foundations of interface discussion. We have to do some definitions. If, like, to discuss interfaces and dive into you know, how you can break apart interfaces and advanced stuff, which I left out of this, which is like interface metrics. There's a whole science to be able to break down the actual time it'll take someone to mentally and physically click through an application. And uh, the lower the time, the more efficient your application is, which the foundation of computing is basically to enable users to do things more efficiently. And a lot of times, an interface will uh, hinder the efficiency of an end user's desired task. So some of the foundations of interface discussion are some interface concepts that we're going to go over here shortly are modes. Um, modes are basically, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the definitions in here. So you've got modes, you have gestures, appropriate gestures, <coughs> ranges, and then you should have something else here, and quasi-modes. Okay, and then there's basic user concepts, habitual interactions, masking, conflict and decision, and absolutism. Okay, so modes. Okay, we have basic flashlight concept. It's a, it's a design we've probably all seen. And this flashlight has two different modes. Mode A is off, and mode B is on. Now, in a flashlight's case, that mode is changed by clicking the button, okay? So when the flashlight is off, you do the, click the button, the mode is set to on. And we're gonna use this flashlight example to kind of go through the rest of these definitions. So gestures. Gestures are a set of actions completed automatically once they're set in motion. Um, some examples of a gesture would be typing the. If I tell you to type the, you don't think type T, type H, type E, you think type the. You cluster those commands into a single fluid action, um, and that's a gesture. Because once you start typing the, you just type it. And uh, 
Another example would be catching a baseball. You don't think about, okay, watch the baseball till it hits my glove, close my hand. You know, it's a, it's a reaction. You, you catch it, you look at it, you follow it, and catch it in the glove. Um, basically, reactive things are gestures, um, pointing and clicking, double clicking. You don't think click once, click twice, a couple milliseconds later. You double click. Um, click and submit. So in the flashlight example, a gesture would be actually clicking a button to change the mode. Okay, and uh, we'll go into that a little more. Ranges. Okay, what a range is, is in the flashlight example, the gesture of clicking the button for each mode has basically a range of two. Because each time you click that button, if the, if the flashlight's on, you click the button, it's off. If the flashlight's off and you click the button, the same action to turn it on, it goes off. And so you have a single interface element that has two distinct responses to a single gesture. Okay, so basically a range is a set of states that any given gesture has a particular or single interpretation. So basically if you have a, a great example for the web is form submit buttons. People use the term submit or like send on all of the buttons on a form. And uh, while because it's different pages, the user typically gets it and we're forced to use it, psychologically, technically, since they're all labeled submit, they should all be doing the same exact action, but they're different forms, so they're really not. So a lot of times you can use different qualifiers, so like submit estimate, or submit contact form, or submit con information, to clarify really what you're submitting. Um, Basically, the more modes an application has, the greater the range of its gestures. The more set, uh, exactly, the flashlight, on or off, and then you have the interpretation of off and on, as I said, but the more modes you have, the tens that a single button or a single element will have multiple things that it can do. And ultimately, it ends up confusing your user because the same gesture in different parts of the application doesn't have the same response. Um, a good example of this would be if, well, we'll, we'll discuss that here. Quasimodes. Okay, what a quasimo is, is an example of either changing the mode or temporarily changing the mode so as not to confuse the, the user. Caps lock. How many of you have ever hit the caps lock until you start typing and you have all of, you know, you give given things in caps lock, you have to go back and basis it because you just changed the mode of your application and it, it wasn't a quasi mode. It wasn't temporary, as in just wanting to capitalize a single letter. And uh, so the light on and off, you turn the light on or off, opposed to a motion censored light that you do a gesture, it turns on, but then when that gesture ceases, the light goes off. Or a great thing for uh, Windows is a dock bar or the start menu. Um, a dock bar is constant, which is a good thing for a Mac. Like you have access to your applications. On Windows, they pick the wrong use of a quasi mode and they make you click and go through a list of menus to get to what you want every time you do it. Um, quasi modes allows for the fewest possible gestures to have more than a single range or interpretation, which basically means that instead of changing the mode of your application and causing the user to wonder, will this still submit the same way or change it, you temporarily change it for the sequential action that they want to do. They like shift, it shifts the next letter, but the rest you don't have to worry about, is it still gonna be in capital letters? Um, and that's important when designing interfaces because the, it'll guide the user um, to learning habitual actions against your interface without being uh, downtrodden by wondering what mode they're in. An example would be applications, uh, Dreamweaver again. Have everyone used Dreamweaver at some point in time? I'm sure. Uh, there's like three different layouts you can choose, like the code expert, the designer layout, and they change things around and how it functions. And if you've ever switched between modes from one computer to the next or whatnot, it sometimes will take you forever trying to find what you're looking for because they have different places they put it trying to be conducive to what you're doing. But a lot of times that will end up hindering you because you're familiar with it in one place, but the mode of your application has just changed. And so you're hunting for what you're trying to do. And therefore, your efficiency of using that application goes down sometimes drastically. 
and you struggle trying to actually achieve what you want, and instead of working on what your task is, whether it's designing or programming a website, you're working on trying to figure out how to do your task. And that should never be the case. So let's take about some, some basics of uh, human psychology is a habitual interaction. Basically, over time, as a user performs repetitive tasks, the action and responses of the user towards the interface become subconscious reaction. Okay, what this means is basically confirmation alert boxes. Uh, if you have a, are you sure you want to delete this, okay, or cancel, okay? Basically, over time, how many of you have actually clicked yes out of habit? You sit there deleting like 50 things. You click delete, yes, delete, yes, delete, yes, delete, yes. Oh, shit, I didn't want to delete that one. <laughs> um, it's, it's a habitual action. So any static confirmation box that is to issue a warning or an alert of a severe change or undoable method um, is pretty much just a bad decision on an interface design part because it becomes a habitual action for the end user. And therefore, at one point in time, they're going to do something that they don't really want to do. Um, a way around that would be to have your text box change or you know, appear in different ways. But altogether, they, they end up pretty much causing more problems than they do uh, helping. A second would be duplicating gestures uh, forces users to choose how to complete their desired task and distracting the user's locus of attention from the current task. A lot of times, uh, companies will have a way to, uh, a, a good example would be, you have the command line version of something, you have a graphical button you can do something, or you have a, a menu you can go here and s select something, or you have a hotkey that you can do something to. Um, I know if you use an IDE, you have all those options. You can do everything you want five different ways. The problem is, is subconsciously, as you learn more than one way to do it, you're subconsciously always debating, is there a right way or a wrong way, which is better? And, you know, you might have a habitual action that you end up getting into over time, but it's a slower process to getting into that habitual uh, use of the gestures of your application because you're in conflict subconsciously about which one is better. Um, the, the basic psychology principle there is anytime you give a user more than one choice or more than uh, any duplicate number of options, the, the human mind always tries to rank them in order. We try, we try to make organized of a group of elements, um, like anything from, you know, you give someone th three exact same cars. They're going to look at all three cars trying to figure out which one's the better of the three cars. It's just human nature. And uh, a lot of times applications tend to forget that and they want convenience where it ends up inconveniencing the user because they're not comfortable in what they're doing because they're not sure if what they're doing is right. Um, and so basically multi-range gestures slow down the user's time to completion when they're trying to commit a task. Um, so if you're a web developer trying to use Dreamweaver and you're trying to figure out which way is the best way to do it, should you edit and save this way and upload or do this or that or use this way to upload or use this way to save or to convert it using this function, um, you end up wasting more time trying to figure out how to do something than actually doing what you're trying to do. And then basically, we're avoiding the point of software. You know, we're making it so we're, we're making it more labor intensive using a tool that's supposed to help us than it is actually helping us. This slide doesn't like me. Come on. Okay. Let me make sure I went right away. Okay. So the next concept is masking. Now, masking is. Uh, you see a lot more on the web now with the things such as the light box. And basically a mask is a way to direct the user's locus of attention to where you want it to be by dimming the surrounding distractions or potential locuses of attention. Um, you, have, you have different types of masks. You have an audio mask. And uh, audio masking is, a, is a, a way to distract the user from one sense to another. While there might be a visual or noticeable delay in your application, creating a sound, um, such as the Microsoft startup sound, tends to distract the user for seconds 
from the time it takes to load something. So as their conscious mind or their attention shifts onto the sound and then back to the software, the aim is that the software has loaded so the user doesn't really even notice the delay. Um, Visual masking. Uh, a great example of this would be light boxes. A lot of time you use a transparent window to lay over the rest of a website or the rest of an application with the content that's of interest to the user in the center. And what that does is it basically allows them to focus on what they're doing without seeing um, the other elements that they were working on and therefore keeping their mind focused on the task at hand. Um, and then other masking is basically interactive masking. Um, this is not very common on the web, but basically an interactive mask is uh, a visual wizard where just say it takes several steps in loading times to create a new, just say a web page in CMS. If you break it down into steps that the user does it in parts, you can tend to save things in smaller bytes and therefore the initial creation of the page will seem to go faster and more smoothly for a user because they're completing the next task in the process why the first task saved that data and they're not waiting for a response. Um, and and that's, that's tricky to, to really accurately define because there's different ways to do interactive masking. But uh, an example of effectiveness of masking is there was a study, um, which I don't have the reference in my slideshow, done in 1998 for Solitaire. How many of you have played Solitaire on Windows or on a, a computer of any kind? Okay, so now what they did is they gave people these computers and sat them down and just said, just keep playing Solitaire and uh, let us know if you get frustrated playing Solitaire. And so they had people play Solitaire and all that and they, they start a new game, it makes a nice shuffle noise and the new deck comes up and they play it. And then they inadvertently throughout the study turn the sound off. And pretty quickly, users started to become annoyed on the delay when they start a new game, waiting for the new deck to cycle in. Because their mind focused right on the new deck when they started a new game, instead of being distracted for the couple seconds it took to create a new deck by the sound of the shuffling deck. And therefore, the user didn't even notice the delay until the sound was missing. And that's basically an example of masking, is uh, the same thing a magician does. You're distracting them with one thing while performing something else that has to be done, response times or whatever with software. And uh, this ends up producing a, a better end experience for the user. And um, you know, they're basically more comfortable using what they're doing. Okay, conflict and decision and absolutism. Is, I covered this a little early, basically. Um, giving a user more than a single choice for any given gesture causes them to conflict, which is the more correct or better um, choice, even when they're equivalent. And the monotony of gestures will allow users to gain confidence in their actions. And what that means is an ideal uh, interface would have one mode and all of its gestures would have one range of action. Um, and what that would do is if there was only one way for you to create a new page in Dreamweaver, edit that page, save that page, and upload that page, you would eventually become so comfortable with that process um, fairly quickly that you'd be able to do that more and more efficiently at the more times you did it. example. Um, what that basically is, is, is where, where this would apply to that is in the IDE, you're basically running multiple applications. You have like a design mode application and then you have your programming application. They're, they're technically not, this, they shouldn't be the same interface because they're two separate goals. Um, so, so this is for like a, a single application at a time. So if you have a, a large environment or system that has multiple applications like a blogging engine, a CMS engine. This should be applied to individual items and not one as a whole because basically 
like if you're in design mode in the IDE and editing a designer, yeah, you have certain tasks that are same, but you're in the application task of designing the interface and visually how it looks. Where if you're programming it, you still use those tasks, but you're in the mindset of actually creating the code. And so that's, that's that separation. Um, basically, characteristic, characteristics of human interfaces is uh, humane interfaces that are humanized should be uh, intuitive and simple. Uh, an example of this would be things like the dock bar on a Mac, because I know a lot of people are Mac users. When you, when you hover over something on a dock bar, it either lights up or it expands a little bit, showing you that that's the one you selected. You don't have to um, single click on Windows and have it highlight the text of the icon to say that that's selected or that's the one you're going to be click on. You know, uh, I'm sure if you've ever used Windows, you try to click on an icon and you've clicked in the wrong area or you end up not in the right place or it doesn't do what you think. Where, okay, so the dock bar example, it, it hovers. It, it kind of lets you know that, yes, this is what's going to happen if you click on here. It's going to run this application. Um, and, and basically, that's uh, the more intuitive and simple an app uh, interface is, uh, the easier it is to use software, and again, the more efficient your users will be able to use what you're creating. Um, basically, the, it, yeah, as I said, it improves the efficiency of task completion, and this is quantifiable. I originally, before last night when I rewrote everything, was going to go into the metrics of measuring interfaces. And there's, there's things like homing and pointing and mental preparation, which have seconds and different calculations applied to them. And then you have all these roles that you apply to the action of clicking a submit button. And you can calculate, in general, how long it would take a user to go through that task. And it really gives you a good insight of how efficient your interface is, because um, there's times where one, one solution opposed to a next might be uh, a one and a half second delay. But if you do that 10 times over, you're losing a minute and a half in actually accomplishing the complete uh, cluster of tasks that they're trying to achieve. And uh, so it is quantifiable, but we're not going to go into that details because I'm sure if you guys want to study that, I can give you more information. But it's, it's pretty hairy at times. Um, and I spelled I independent wrong, so uh, excuse me for that. I didn't catch that. Uh, basically. Characteristics of human interfaces, they should be language and culturally independent. Now, this isn't a perfect world. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to abstract the interface away from language dependence unless you do translation. And culturally, it's kind of hard unless you have a lot of people to work on it to bring in the perspective of having lived in that culture. But ideally, uh, it would be language and culturally independent. So some examples of that. OK, how many have ever tried to set a VCR clock? and found it to be a pain in the rear. OK? It's, it can be really annoying. Now, so we have, we have Felix here. You speak German, Felix, right? That was your native language, is German? Yeah. And you guys have VCRs in Germany, right? Uh, you did, at one point in time, I hope. Um, well, if this was a clock, would you know how to change the time on that clock? Uh, so. Well, OK, so these, these little arrows are buttons. Okay, it, you didn't need to know German or English to understand that, right? So that's that's an example of an application that doesn't have cultural or language dependence. What? Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could you could put the interface to be numerical and still go up or down. So <laughs> yeah, lo <laughs> siento. Throw another one in there. Um, an example: elevator buttons. They might have different symbols on them. I don't know if they do in Germany or not, but most places I've seen up and down arrows for an elevator or a lift. Um, it, it doesn't really require a, a language or cultural support for it um, in most cases. So KPHP, how is it humanized? And uh, this one is actually one of the things I rewrote a lot of last night because I didn't mention Cake PHP enough, and I was like, I want to kind of mention the whole point of Cake Fest since they're here. And there's a lot of the elements of humanization found in Cake PHP because a framework is an interface for you, the developer, to the programming language, basically. And uh, so all of these things apply to the core team of how they should be developing Cake into how you are building your software. 
I'm an example. Some of the, the elements that we're going to go over quick are behaviors, components and helpers, and, and plugins and vendors. Okay, so behaviors in Cake PHP. A behavior, um, basically, Cake PHP behaviors allow for the, the presentation not to go. Okay, modes. Behaviors allow you to do the act as syntax, which, how many of you are familiar with behaviors? Um, okay, what a behavior does is it allows you to abstract out model logic um, into um, something that can be applied to any one of your models. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of a simple behavior that's there. Um, the tree. Yeah, so, so go, go make him, listen to him about making models behave. But uh, behavior is basically, huh? You're welcome. Um, it's the Argen, Ar Ar Argentinian wonder uh, on show tomorrow. Uh, but so basically what a behavior does is allows you to apply logic to every model just saying act as like a, he said a tree. So you can make every one of your models do tree functionality with one behavior. And so basically what you can do is you can set the mode of your model by assigning it a behavior. Okay. Quasi modes. Because it's a programming language that we can have parameters, you can say, you know, when doing a find in a model, it acts as tree, but if it doesn't find something or this is not true, don't actually do that mode and retain the normal mode. So behaviors can actually set modes completely, or if you add parameters, they can essentially become quasi-modes for your application. Um, gesture monotony. Uh, this, this, was, uh, this is originally, KPHP had a little more gesture monotony in its, in its model commands than it does now because they, they made it a, a better programming language. Um, but having to save, find, delete functions, uh, it does the same thing in every one of the models. Your content is different. So you're saving different data at different times, but the actual gesture is taking your content and putting it into the database, or the, the database, uh, or the, wherever you're storing it, depending on your DBO. Um, so, yeah, so the, basically you have gesture monotony because uh, you're reading information, you're saving, finding, or deleting information. And so that's basically, there's one range to each one of those functions. Save doesn't at one time save it to a database, and another time save it to a file, you know. And uh, that's, that's an example of that. So components and helpers. Um, basically, KHP, PHP components and helpers create monotony in programming gestures and methods. Now, what components and helpers do is they allow you to create gestures for your application. Um, an example would be the tree helper. You want to output an array of information from the tree behavior into an actual uh, UL element in your navigation. That is a single gesture anywhere in any of your applications because of that helper. You create the, uh, I believe it's, a, what is it, a tree or whatever function that you can pass data into, and it outputs that tree no matter where you're at. And uh, so components and helpers basically are um, gestures for your view and the output of your data inside Cake PHP. Plugins and vendors. Basically, plugins are mini apps that have their own humanized characteristics. When developing a, uh, a plugin, you should basically apply all of the, the humanization principles inside of that plugin. And uh, plugins, in their own right, it's it's really it's not a plugin more than it's a mini app. And uh, yeah, they they basically have the same roles. Like you can have a behavior in a plugin. Um, and that extends the mode in your plugin. And so it's really the same thing as the behaviors and helpers and components inside of the main cake app. It's just small. So vendors aid in development efficiency, loading third party classes into an existing system. Now, what vendors do is basically um, the port of a framework is to speed up your development time. And if you've already written an uber complex class, that integrates into your company's legacy system or ties into Facebook or ties into this or that, 
you don't want to have to rewrite it inside of Cake in order to access that functionality, essentially. And so vendors basically allow you to speed up your development time and make it more efficient by loading in external classes and using them inside the framework. And so um, that holds true to making your job as a developer more efficient. So a quick measure for all of this, because I know it's, it's a lot of information. I tried to make it simple and something that you may have got something out of. Excuse me. A quick way to measure you know, how efficient or humanized is my application. Basically, if your interface was accidentally switched into a language that you could not read or speak, how well could you still carry out your desired tasks? OK. There's also various methods to quantify, which I discussed. Basically, there's metrics to it. You can actually assign numbers to it and, and measure it that way. But that's, that's basically a quick measure to sum up most of this. Is if your, again, VCR clock got stuck in the wrong mode in Spanish, and you didn't know Spanish or couldn't read Spanish, how hard is it for you to get back to actually change it back into that mode? And so that's, that's a way to uh, determine how effective your interface really is. Um, OK, so I'm going to go into real world application in a minute. I just want to quickly uh, tie a lot of those concepts together in a, a, the flashlight example. Um, so if you were to humanize a flashlight and say, how do we make a flashlight better? We would say, OK, we have the on and off button. And the problem is, is you click that button. When it's on, it goes off. And you do the same action, and it turns it back on. Now, let's say the, the flashlight didn't give off any heat, and it was in a duffel bag. And you, as the user, wanted to check if that light was on or off. You could reach in your bag, but you have no way of telling whether it's on or off without actually having to look at it. Because that button has two different gestures that complete two different actions. So if it were a single mode flashlight, which would be a switch to push it up as on and a switch to push it down as off, it would be a single toggle button that has only one gesture that allows you to determine you can reach in the bag and see is it pushed up or down and know whether it's on and off without having to actually look at the flashlight. And uh, so some real world examples of humanization. And um, we at, I work for uh, Vigor Branding. Um, I didn't do it about me, but basically I'm a software developer for a marketing and branding company. Um, I've owned several software companies and I have been doing software development for 10 plus years in everything from enterprise banking applications to fun film cake applications. And um, basically, I spent the past year saying, what do 90% of our customers come to us wanting? They want a CMS, or they want a blog, basically, or a news syndicate thing. Or they want to be able to manage where the pages are on their site and all that. But they don't know anything about design or, or HTML, for that matter. And a lot of solutions out there, you know, uh, CMSs are a CMS and they have to be extended or convoluted to be more than that or to tie a blog in. Or you have to be running a CMS and a blog to give the user both that functionality. And basically, we wanted to get rid of that. Um, and so what I set forward doing is, is building a modular system that is completely, it's a basically a framework that allows me to build a CMS or a blog by just putting in those components. And uh, we've gone through and tried to humanize it and will continue to actually do so in, in what we're doing. And so just quick examples of how we did uh, things is uh, here we have it's the, the navigation editor. And uh, it's, it's hard to see on this one, but uh, we have the navigation button that's actually depressed. It's a 3D thing, so you can tell that you're a navigation manager. So that's the mode you're in. So you have a uh, indicator of where you're actually at in the application, as well as a text label, which is language independent, but it lets you know this is what you're doing, your navigation, you're editing your navigation. So uh, we have very simple and clearly defined buttons, which are defined language-wise. Um, and so you know, a lot of this we couldn't make completely humanized because we had to depend on language, because, well, I don't have two years to develop to it. Um, so we have we create a new link to create new menu buttons, which do that. And they bring up an actual masked form, which I should have showed you, and I can at the end if you wish to see it. And it masks the entire application with the little form that will let you do the task to create a new menu or whatnot. Um, and then basically, we took it and said, okay, how is a menu on a website typically structured? It's a tree. 
it's usually a UL list and style, and it's, it's, there's, there's elements. Content is, has child elements and they have parent elements and all that. And so we built a navigation thing that allows the user to drag and drop their content pages or their latest external sites um, wherever they want to, and it will reflect on, on the uh, front side of things. And uh, we also, instead of having it be where you click on this and then have to go up to a bar to click edit or to click you know, change or to click delete, um, put all the links on each of the trees that drag and drop with the elements. So if the user wants to delete an element here, on that same line, he clicks the edit or the delete button. And it's kind of intuitive in that manner that they know that they have to click on the same line in order to do it to that action. Um, because subconsciously, they group these as they see them. Where if these actions were a single action at the top, it might take someone some time to realize that they have to actually go up and click on that button. Um, sadly enough, but I have clients that that is an extreme case. It took them several minutes to find out how to do things. Uh, gesture interpretation. Uh, this isn't completely skinned. I had to do this for my dad version because I changed the slideshow last night, so it's a little hard to follow. But basically, we have the blogs and the blog comment section that are, are two tables of information. And uh, how we did gesture interpretation is when a user would select a blog post of any kind, you know, automatically filter the comments to highlight only the ones that relate to that thing and mask the others. And so what it does is they can see visually what comments are associated with that blog when they go to click on a comment. And so if the user wants to edit that blog and then jump over to editing comments related to it, we've already assumed that if they're interested in a single blog, they may be interested in knowing what comments are related to that blog. Um, so human elements, some, some things we added to this uh, that are seen elsewhere and hopefully we implemented better are drag and drop image galleries, which I couldn't get a screenshot of because I couldn't get an internet connection in my room to grab a, a version that was skin. And basically what we did is we have a, a left panel that has folders that you can create a new gallery and name it. And then you can upload images that you see little thumbnails and simply drag them into the folder you want them. And a human element of the drag and drop is when you do a multi-selection or a single selection of images, when you start dragging with the mouse follows really tiny thumbnails of all the images that you've actually selected. So you can even see which ones you're exactly dragging in. You don't have to assume that all the ones highlighted are. You can actually see each one of it. So the user has no question of what images they're moving into. Um, WYSIWYG inline editing. Um, what you see is what you get editing is very popular on the web, uh, Tiny MCE and uh, FCK Editor, and a lot of people have done it. And the issue that we found a lot of times is while it's all fine dandy to allow you to edit content and keep it in format, a lot of people who don't really understand the web um, or really know what's going on will see that form of their content in a box, in a form for adding a new page, and they don't understand how it's going to look on the site or what context it is. Like, am I left in, if, if it says left side content, they, they don't associate too well that this is a little bar on the left and it's going to be scrunched or, or whatever in the design. It doesn't translate so well. And so I'll show an example of how we approach that here in a sec. So undo, undo, undo. This is something I forgot to mention when talking about uh, confirmation boxes there is the key to getting rid of confirmation boxes like when someone clicks delete, is have an undo button and allow people to undo everything. So if they click on delete, make it be a soft delete so they click undo and restore that. Did you, did you hand me oh, no, right. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so that's another key. So this is basically an example of inline editing, which I'm, it, I'm sorry it wasn't styled, but basically what we do is you see the entire website, how it looks on the web. The top headers and the bottom headers are actually matched so you can't click on them, they're grayed over which on a, a design colored website shows up a lot better. Um, and so the user can see in context their website without actually having to um, go look at it or do a preview. And then they click on a section of text and it puts them in an editor with the, the HTML options on top and they can just basically type in their content and click save and exactly how that looks there is, it'll apply CSS styles that will show up in there too. 
and it'll put it right in the section of the website. So they can see the page that they just edited and exactly how it looks. So if they want to change the size of a paragraph or add another paragraph, they can do that as they're editing it. And therefore, they don't have to go into a preview mode and take their attention from creating their content to looking to make sure it looks okay and then taking their attention back to re-editing it and then going back to preview it. Because what you end up doing is the user has to go back and forth and back and forth and it becomes a slower process for them just to create the page. Um, some other features we have, just to say on, on Vim, is uh, we have e-commerce uh, uh, humanized features. We have an entire e-commerce shopping cart built on top of it. And I have lost sale prevention. Um, a lot of times in, in conversions in e-commerce, uh, users will try to check out and they'll put in the wrong credit card. And they'll do it a couple times or they'll, they'll keep on the wrong information and they get, get those validation errors and say, this is incorrect before you can continue, fill it out. And sometimes people get frustrated and say, you know, I'll just come buy this later. You know, I'll just come back later and, and shop or when I get a different credit card. And uh, we avoided that by what happens is if there's three, we have classes of errors like a, a wrong credit card, incorrect information, or missing information. And what it does is if a user tries to submit any kind of thing three times or more and it doesn't validate, it submits their manual via email. It sends the order to an email address and has a little form that they say, what's a good phone number to contact and what's a good time to call to confirm your order? And basically a little message telling them that we'll follow up and help you process your order. And uh, what that's done for a lot of our clients is their conversion ratios have gone up significantly because users don't end up not buying the product out of frustration of trying to use the interface in the car. Um, another one we did for users is visual credit card validation. Is um, we is a sense of security and for our own measure when someone enters a credit card and we have, to the best of my knowledge, every global major credit card that there is in the system as far as recognition. It shows a little icon like if you use the Visa card, it will show you a little Visa symbol. And what that does is it basically, um, it gives the user the comfort in knowing that you are keeping a close eye on their transaction. You're taking people's money, so they're generally very concerned. And so what this does is it says, okay, we recognize this is where your money's come from. You entered your card correctly. We're going to be charging it. And it just gives, basically, the user becomes more comfortable with that checkout process, and they don't second-guess themselves or conflict and look at the numbers saying, you know, is this going to be the correct card number? That's another little human feature we added. Um, content diversity, thanks to uh, Fishy. He uh, just is releasing today, I believe at some point in time, he wrote a little versioning behavior. And uh, I haven't tested it completely yet, but it looks good. And uh, I have to do that today for him. But uh, basically what we can do is a, a client can version their content. So if a manager or editor can review and make changes, but they can't publish those changes until um, a person above them either approves it or publishes it themselves. And uh, what that does is it allows users to delegate. Our clients can say, I can have this other person in a thing, go onto our website, edit stuff without worrying about whether they can screw it up or not. And uh, built-in SEO tools basically um, our entire system is built around uh, the Google blog and what they say a website should be as far as SEO goes. It does slugs, thanks to uh, the slug behavior that's in PHP. It does um, HTML cleanup. It does, uh, it actually does, um, I wrote a tag uh, parsing function that can go through all the HTML attribute tags, whether it's an image or not, and put in the no reference tags on links and strip out anything extra and it puts them in a JavaScript class, which will apply, like, uh, basically to whatever element it would be. I don't have a great example of that, but it basically makes it so it's the bare minimal HTML needed on the content when they submit new content or create new pages, and makes it so the, the search engine will. Um, so that's, that's the basis of, of humanization and web applications, and. Uh, Hopefully it didn't bore you and you learned something from it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me here. If you want to say, hey, how can I humanize this better? Feel free. So, yes.
I kind of like to have the first column on the left be the, the actual item, like the person name, and have that hyperlink to be that's just another way of doing it. it. But then that's giving them two options. Do they click on the name to go to that record, or do they click on one of the action links instead? True, and then so they're always wondering, you know, which one's going to go where, or you know, it's, it's definitely a conflict there. And uh, if you saw on that that slide, the, the reason we chose to put our links in a single location on the right, I won't bother, is because that they're drag and droppable. We have an icon that is going to show that you click here and can drag the bar, and we didn't want to have active links near that side. But, yeah. So. You had mentioned something about the. Uh, when you use checkboxes as opposed to radio buttons. And I always kind of wonder that myself. You want to know? So okay. I was wondering what that's, a, that's a great example. Um, let me, let me uh, see if I can do something here to help explain it. Um, let's take an example. Let's say we have a software programmer that is often asked to convert temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit during his work day. And our goal is to write a mini application to help him do that more quickly so he can jump to that task in that mode, put in his information, give the response to whoever's asking to convert the temperature, and get back to what he's doing. Um, let me... So, Let's go, I'm going to be doing drawing some boxes quick to try to explain this. So, let's say our application is, we have a box. And then, okay, so. Let's say we build an application for a temperature, and you can choose the radio buttons at the top would be Celsius or Fahrenheit, and then you put the numeric value that they would want, and he gets the output of what he wants. Okay? Uh, so you know another way you could could do that was if. Um, You know, that's a situation where it's one value or another. The user has to choose one to know what they're converting to. Um, I'm trying to, like, the difference between a radio box and a check button is kind of hard because uh, what would be a, a typical instance would be uh, active or inactive, like true would be published or a radio button would be published. Um, the, the, uh, that would be a, a better example. This is going into interface efficiency stuff. So, example, if you have a, a content page that they can click a checkbox to be published or they can check it to be unpublished. Or you have a radio button that says published and unpublished. The checkbox, the user is going to click on it. And does clicking that box mean that it's now published? Or does clicking that box mean that it's unpublished? Or if it's unpublished and you make it published, like you set that value to true. But at any given time, depending on what state it is, the user can't directly interpret what they're doing. Like unchecking a box that says published or publish your page might mean that you're unpublishing it, or it might not. Like, it's hard to explain because we all know that checkbox on publishing means it's published. But to someone who doesn't understand the web, it might not translate that way. Where a radio button, if they click on, well, this is a good example, actually. I switched that, I'm sorry, that's why I'm confusing myself. A radio button, published or unpublished, if they have the radio button that's published, is it going to publish their site, or is it going to change the status? Um, yes, yeah, see, I'm, I'm trying to do this when I... I have an example that's written, I can't think of it. Uh, really what it comes down to is uh, clearly defining what the action is. is uh, a toggle button would be a better example. Is, do you ever use a toggle button to do things? Where the button has two different states? Where if you have a toggle button that says publish or unpublish, when you click on it, is it publishing it or is it unpublishing it? And is it when it's down and it's published, is it published? Or is it when it's up and it's published and it's published? You know? um, because it's the single button that does something. And so the determining between whether you use a checkbox or a radio button is, is 
basically take the individual element you're trying to control and look at it and say, how clearly defined is what the action that the person wants to accomplish? Like, if the, the checkbox is true to set a parameter um, on or off, how clearly is it that checked means on, you know, like a, a feature settings for an application to check it to be on? How clear is that to a user? Or does it need qualification? Like simple things like published is easy, but if it's a complex thing you're trying to toggle, is it easier to use a radio button and have a longer field that maybe describes if this one's selected, your site will be on, if this one's selected, your site will be off. And uh, it really comes down to individual interfaces of determining, you know, how is the user going to interpret this in the context of your application? I don't know if that helps at all. I, I kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's widgets. Like there's, there's widgets for everything and, and applying them at certain points will make a difference in, in what it is. And that's, that's part of learning humanization is so you as a developer can make those choices, you know, more accurately. And uh, if you really need to decide, you can actually do metrics and find out which one's faster, checkbox or radio button, and determine, you know, from there. So, well, that's, that's that. Some more questions. Hopefully you got something out of it. Okay, thank you.